Good morning again, folks. Today, God's Word, Scriptures and God's Word this morning is 1 John 1, 1 through 4, and Acts 5, 20. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked at, and our hands have touched, this is the this we proclaim concerning the word of life. The life appeared, we have seen it, we have testified to it, and we proclaim to you the eternal life, which was with the Father and has appeared to us. We proclaim to you what we have seen and heard, so that you also may have fellowship with us. And our fellowship with is the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. We write this to make our joy complete. So stand in the temple courts, he said, and tell the people all about this good life. So be it. sure it's not, huh? A little static there. Let's start with prayer. Father in heaven, we just thank you for this beautiful day. Lord, we thank you for the freedom that we have in this country to come and worship you. Lord, help us to not take such a great salvation lightly, but Lord, to fear you with wisdom and with knowing that we have a good, perfect, heavenly Father that loves us so much. Lord, let us also realize the freedoms that we have and use the opportunities as much as we can to tell others about this wonderful salvation that we have through Jesus Christ. Lord, just thank you for us being able to come here today, Lord, open our hearts and minds to hear your word and apply them to our lives. May we be a light to this world, Lord, and we just thank you and praise you for all of your mercy, all of your grace, all of your love. We pray these in Jesus' name. Amen. So. I'm going to start by reading you a little bit of this. Did you put a title up there yet? Well, you... Yeah, go ahead. Save to Suffer. Think about that a little bit. Because this isn't, you know, the best topic. It's not how you fill the pews and say, come on in. You know, get saved so you can suffer for Jesus. Not, not a way to make a lot of converts necessarily. But as we read Acts, you'll know that's exactly what's going on. So this is just publication that comes from Voice of the Martyrs. They're just one uh, missionary group out there that you can give to, not, saying, not endorsing them or anything else, just reading article. And it's talking about um, the Christians that we see in other countries. And this first one here says, as biblical, as biblical Christians have shared the gospel and planted churches... In the north, they're talking about in Ethiopia, some members of the Ethiopian Orthodox Church have carried out violent attacks against them, and in some cases, traditional Christians have sided with Muslims against the biblical Christians who are perceived as a common enemy. Did you know that we're enemies as proclaiming Christians? You know, we have our divisions here in this country but in other countries, not, are they, not only are Christians persecuted by non-believers, but they're persecuted by uh, believers. How can we do that? How can the love of God be in us? This next article is about when terror comes to home, losing everything. And her husband has gone to prison, and he gets out of prison, and then gets murdered, you know, when he comes out of prison. And we're going to see some of that in today's scriptures. Um, shortly after she prayed, we're we'll going to start here, the men dragged Fazia and her family outside where they watched in horror as the attackers doused their home with gasoline and set it ablaze. Lord, if this fire is from you, she prayed, let it continue. No one can stop it. 
But if this fire is from the devil, let it be extinguished. Shortly after she prayed, suddenly a, a sudden rain extinguished the fire. Although about half of her home continued to smolder and smoke, she was grateful that the fire didn't consume everything. As the mob grew increasingly frustrated, however, they began to steal food and other belongings from Fazia's house, destroying whatever remained. Then she heard a frightening shout from a celebrated Islamist, we killed the main person, the leader is dead. As the attackers sang with joy, Fazia's heart sank. She followed the crowd until her worst fears were conformed and she found her husband's body beheaded lying on the ground. The men who killed were dancing around the, uh, his body as she wept in horror. Her and her daughter ran, picked up his head, and dragged his body away from the attackers. I can't imagine. And we don't suffer here in this world, in this country, in this church, in this body, to proclaim Jesus. So are we taking advantage of that? As we look at Acts chapter 5, I want you to think about the fact that the, the apostles were saved to suffer. There's a miraculous intervention that we're going to read about where an angel comes in and takes the apostles from the prison and says, go back and preach all the words of life. And I want you to think about what that means and the different translations say that differently. But all the words about this life in Christ this new life, what it means to be a Christian, what it means to be a follower of Jesus, what does that mean? And if you're not suffering, oh, <coughs> praise God, because I'm not going to say it, if you're not suffering, you're, you're, you're not living as a Christian, you're in this place in this time God has put you, and if you're not suffering, thank Him for it. But will you follow Him in the suffering? Because we know scripture after scripture will come to your mind now that suffering builds character, perseverance, so forth. But if we're not suffering, we have every opportunity to proclaim Jesus Christ boldly right now without persecution. So are we doing that? Merle read the scriptures from 1 John 1, 1 through 4 and Acts 5.20. 1 John 1, 1 read that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, we have seen with our eyes, we have looked at, our hands have touched. This is the word that we proclaim, the word of life, the whole Christian life, what it means to follow Jesus. How again could two different groups that say they believe in God quarrel amongst each other and try to kill one another? How can we be divided rather than united in sharing the gospel message? How can we not love even our enemies? And you'll see this in Acts. There's no animosity towards the Sadducees and everything. Each time Peter just goes in and proclaims Jesus Christ. He is the Messiah. You killed him. He rose from the dead. Now you still have a chance to repent and turn to God and have your sins wiped away. Verse 2 of 1 John 1, The life appeared. We have seen it and testify it to, to it, and we proclaim to you the eternal life, which was from the Father and has appeared to us. We proclaim to you that we have, what we have seen and heard so that you may have fellowship. Fellowship with us and our fellowship is with the Father and with the Son, Jesus Christ. We wrote this to make our joy complete to be one. And then we've got the verse from Acts 5.20. Go stand in the temple courts, he said, and tell the people all about this new life. This new life, what does that mean? Saved to suffer, what do I mean by that? Fellowship, I'll go over the word again in the Greek, what it means. It's koinonia. Jesus had it with God. He still has it with God. He'll forever have it with God. He had it with his disciples. He will forever have it with his disciples. It is something that all believers share. It is a commonness, a oneness, a partnership, in fellowship, intimacy, communion, contribution, and participation to this cause as though God were making his reconciliation to man through you and I. 
that men could be saved, which is impossible for man, but very possible, truly possible with God, for all things are possible with God. And he has given you this opportunity to finish, to keep doing the works that Jesus began and started, to live for the kingdom, saving people, extinguishing darkness, bringing light, living a true and abundant life, having fellowship with one another, fellowship with the Holy Spirit, fellowship with Jesus, fellowship with God. So I'm going to start with a review. That means there'll be a test next week, right? Whenever you have a review, there's a test next week. No, I'm just kidding. But I want to lead all up to where we're at in this point because suffering is really going to hit in the church next. And you know what happens. The church spreads. Oh, the Great Commission. You're going to preach in Jerusalem, then Judea, and the surrounding areas until the end of the, world, into the, end of the earth. That's what you're going to do. So we're going to start with Jesus leaves this earth and he assigns you and I everyone that will believe, the apostles first and then who will follow from that, assigns this mission that the, that the apostles have been training for for three years. And you remember, just prior to this, 50 days prior to this, Peter is denying Jesus emphatically. John's there, but he won't open his mouth for fear, and we don't know where the other disciples are. They love Jesus. They, they are sure that he's the Messiah, that he holds the words of life. Go back to John 6 where, where Peter doesn't leave him and abandon him. He, well, how can we? You have the words to, the, to life, this new life in Christ. But just prior to the Holy Spirit coming, we've got men living in fear, and we'll see what happens. Acts chapter 1, verse 1, in my former book, Theopolis, I wrote to you all about what Jesus began to do and teach. Remember that, what Jesus began to do and teach until the day he was taken up into heaven after giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostle he had choose, chosen after his suffering, after he suffered, after he gave up heaven, he didn't have anything on his earth and then suffered and died. Because right now I want to make something clear. Suffering doesn't mean that you have some poverty or this and that. The word literally means it comes up in, in Acts later that we'll get to next week. We won't get that far. They get arrested again and they get flogged or striped or beaten or whatever you want to say. The word literally means stripped of your skin. Stripped because the whip that came would take and rip out a hunk of flesh as it pulled back. It would cut going in and then tear coming out. They were literally skinned for their faith in Jesus Christ. That's what suffering means. I have never suffered for Jesus in this life. Maybe I will, maybe I won't. But the apostles did and they counted it as pure joy. And the people saw Ananias and Sapphira that were posers, that were hypocrites. They saw God's wrath come upon them. They're not scared of men. They're going to go out and proclaim the gospel message and live this life that Jesus talked about. He did this for a period of 40 days and spoke about what? The kingdom of God. He gave convincing proofs that he was alive and talked about the kingdom of God. Jesus is alive. The apostles are going to teach resurrection of Jesus Christ because that's what our hope is based on. And we serve King Jesus, not any other kings. On one occasion, this is verse 4 of chapter 1, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command, do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift that my father had promised, which you have heard me speaking about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. You cannot do this mission alone. This mission is going to be done through the Holy Spirit using you. The Holy Spirit will reveal the truth to you, will reveal Jesus to you, will give you the words to say when you don't know what to say, will pray for you when you don't know how to pray. The Holy Spirit will literally transform you into the image of Christ the more that you let the Holy Spirit do that. But they didn't understand. Verse 6, Then they gathered around him and asked, Lord, are you going to at this time restore the kingdom of Israel? We know about kings and kingdoms, and they thought that Jesus was going to come as the Messiah and restore the kingdom of Israel. Now what does that mean for them? Because you've got to have this attitude. That means we're going to reign with Jesus. 
All this persecution that we're seeing from the, from the Romans and everything, and we're not being beaten and killed. We've just got to submit to them. This stuff's going to end because Jesus is here, the Messiah. We're going to reign with him now. They have a, a big attitude adjustment coming, don't they? Prosperity gospel. I just say that and I'll go on. <laughs> it doesn't teach what Jesus taught. He said to them, It is not for you to know the times or dates the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria and to the utter, utter ends of the earth. I always wanted to go utter. I guess it's a southern thing, and that's a cow's udders, and that just gets me... I've got to get focused back. Then we see angelic messengers because we're going to see them again. We've already talked about and we'll see this as we go through how the Holy Spirit fills and why. But we see angelic messengers. Verse 11, why do you stand here looking into the sky? Don't you have something to do? And what is it at this point? Go sit and wait. Now, of course, there's praying. There's being united in the mission everything else, but go sit and wait because you can't do it without the power. But this same Jesus who was taken from you up into heaven will come back in the same way. You're not going to get the kingdom that you thought you were going to get right now, but you are part of a different kingdom. And this kingdom will come. Jesus will return and it's coming right now because you're helping bring people into the kingdom and you're going to live like kingdom uh, people, children of God here on earth. You're going to live such a life differently that the world, even though they despise you and they want to destroy you, and some places in the world that's still what's happening today, they will see your good works. Because I didn't read the rest of those stories about the people that come to Christ because of the faith there. You know, we kill the leader, but the leader comes back to life. Then his followers are, are, are coming along, we'll, we'll kill them and we'll stomp this out. Here it's been 2,000 years and we haven't stomped out Jesus' name and we won't stomp out, stomp out Jesus' name because he is the way, the truth, and the life. Amen. And one day he will return and set all things right. But they come to, uh, I don't know if there's two or not, it doesn't say right here, I got in my head two, but we see angelic messengers. Verse 10 had two? Okay, I don't have that. Okay, two of them, but I didn't want to say it wrong. <laughs> um, you, this Jesus will come back the same way that he left. Verse 15, In those days Peter stood up among the believers, a group numbering about 120. So we see the numbers of the church and we'll see how they, how they grew. They appoint a, another disciple, another apostle. Verse 24, They prayed. Verse 26, They cast lots. You won't see any more about casting lots because the Holy Spirit has come upon them. But up to this point they prayed, they cast lots, figuring that God would tell them which one should be the, the apostle that they choose. Acts chapter 2, filling of the Holy Spirit. So far, so far we've got Jesus has left and given them the, the mission of continuing the work that he's done, and angelic messengers come and say, what are you guys doing? Get ready for this. Okay. So now we have the filling of the Holy Spirit. Verse 1 of Acts 2, when the day of Pentecost came, they were all gathered together in one place. Suddenly... A sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. All were filled with the Holy Spirit. Peter goes on to say that this promise is for you, it does, it's, for, it's for your servants, it's for the women, it's for the men, it's for the children, it's for all who believe in Jesus Christ. This gift from God that you will be filled with the Holy Spirit. You will have fellowship. God will live in you. Your body is a temple and you are a royal priesthood. And the first thing that they did was proclaim they spoke in tongues because there were so many people there from so many different tongues and different nations, and the gospel message was given to those people through the believers. <clears throat> it was done so that they would proclaim. And we're going to see the next time that we see the, the, the filling of that. Peter is filled with the Holy Spirit, and he says in verse 36, Therefore let all Israel be assured of this. This means the religious leaders and the common people. 
that God has made this Jesus whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah. And believe me, the religious leaders heard what was going on too because they came out when they heard the sound and, and, and the, everything and they came out to see what this was. But they're going to continue to deny Jesus as the Messiah where other people have to make a choice and some people come to Jesus and the numbers grow and the numbers grow. So a choice has to be made. Am I going to believe? And if I believe, does that mean I'm going to live a different life than I lived before, a set-apart holy life? And does that mean that I'll follow Jesus no matter what? That, I, that I, what I say I believe I'm going to do? You've got the examples of Ananias and Sapphira. You've got the examples of, of the man that was healed. You've got the examples of the church. You saw, you saw what they prayed, and we're going to go over that again to remind us. So verse 37 of Acts 2, When the people heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the other apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? Peter replied, Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the, whole, the gift of the Holy Spirit. This promise is for you, your children, and for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. With many other words he warned them and pleaded with them, Save yourselves from this corrupt generation. What does that mean? To me, that means totally that I have got to pull myself out from this world, from the things that in this world that I thought I would put my hope in prior to knowing Jesus, the things that I lived for, the things that were my idols. I've got to live a holy life. I've got to live a set-apart life. My goal in life has got to be to love the Lord my God with all my heart, all my soul, all my strength, all my mind, and to love my neighbor as myself, to love even my enemies. Verse 41, those who accepted this message were baptized. About 3,000 were added to their number that day. The church that Jesus builds, what does it look like? And does our church look like that? Verse 42, I've stressed this one and stressed this one. This is what the church looked like. And it's the same in Acts chapter 4 when we see it. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, devoted to fellowship, to breaking of bread, to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. We'll find out later, though, that the apostles aren't the only one doing these signs. Okay? but the majority of the signs and miracles are by the apostles. Verse 44, all the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts, out in public now. They're not afraid. They broke bread in their homes and ate together, so they're meeting in private also with glad and sincere hearts. Praising God and enjoying the favor of the people, and the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved, brought out of this world into this thing called the church, the kingdom of heaven here on earth. Acts chapter 3. Now a man was lame from birth, was being carried to the temple gate called Beautiful, where he, where he was put to beg every day from those going into the temple courts. He expects something from the church, from the people that profess that they believe in God. But he expects money, these things that we're supposed to be pulled out from again. That we're not supposed to rely on our money. We're supposed to rely on God's daily bread for our nourishment. He was put there to beg, and when he saw Peter and John about to enter, he asked them for money. Let's be specific. Peter looked straight at him, as, as did John. Then Peter said, look at us. So the man gave them his attention, expecting to get something from them. Then Peter said, silver or gold, I don't have. I gave it up for Jesus. But what I do have, I'll give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, walk. There's no notation here that the Spirit filled Peter or anything. You're only going to see when the Spirit fills, we see proclamation of who Jesus is. But Peter walked so much step by step with the Holy Spirit, he knew that that's what would happen. Amazing that he walked that way. This miracle of healing was done so that Peter could proclaim like the miracle of tongues was done so that the people could proclaim. Because we see next that Peter proclaims. In verse 16, he says, By faith in the name of Jesus, this man whom you see 
and now, now has been made strong. It is Jesus' name and the faith that comes through him that has completely healed him, as you can all see. He tells this message to everyone, including the Sadducees and all the religious leaders. A choice has to be made. Verse 19, Repent then and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out. Repent and take on this new way of living where you don't put your trust in the things of the world, but you put your trust in God. Where you live a holy life and you proclaim His name and the Spirit of God works powerfully through each and every one of us. The Spirit gives gifts as the Spirit sees fit. A choice has to be made. Even if it costs you, Right? We see material already given up. We see pride given up. We see people loving one another. Acts chapter 4. The priests and the captains of the temple guard and the Sadducees came up to Peter and John while they were speaking to them, and they were greatly disturbed because the apostles were teaching the people, proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection of the dead which the Sadducees don't even believe in the resurrection of the dead. They don't believe in the Holy Spirit. Guess what else they don't believe in? <laughs> it happens after chapter 5. They don't believe in angels. <laughs> All these things they don't believe in are coming right here because God is screaming out to them, Repent and turn to God so that your sins may be forgiven. And as we read on, we'll see that many of the leaders did turn and repent. The church that Jesus builds... Well, wait a minute. Before I go to that, I need to put verse 3 of Acts chapter 4. They seized Peter and John. Because it was evening, they put them into jail the next day, till the next day. See how this is progressing? Did you sign up for this? <laughs> when, you, when, you, when you accepted Jesus Christ, did you sign up for, uh, i got to give up everything that I have and trust in the Lord? That's what Jesus says. And now I'm going to go to jail? And Acts chapter 5, which we won't get all the way that far yet, I've been released so that I can go back and proclaim and go back to jail again and then get beaten. Is that what you signed up for? Let's look what the church looks like. <clears throat> Verse 4 of Acts chapter 4. But many who heard the message believed. So the number of men who believe grew to be, be about 5,000. Now these 5,000 haven't seen the beatings yet, but they've seen the other things. And they said, sign me up. I believe in Jesus. I believe he's the Messiah. I'm willing to give up this world so that I can follow Jesus. They, all these words rang in their head, in their hearts, to deny themselves, take up their cross, and follow up after Jesus. He's the one that has the words to... To eternal life. He is the Messiah, the one who has come to seek and save the lost. Then we have a filling of the Holy Spirit for Peter, the second filling of the Holy Spirit, and it's so that he's given words to proclaim. Because if you remember, Jesus said, Don't worry about when you're thrown into prison what you'll say, because the Holy Spirit will give you those words at that time. No rehearsed sermon, no planning. Verse 8 of chapter 4, Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, Rulers and elders of the people, If we are being called to account today for an act of kindness, because the things they did, Jesus said in Matthew 6, Let your light shine before men that they may see your good deeds or your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. If we're being called into account for that, shown to a man who was lame and, and you're being asked how he was healed, then know this, you and all the people of Israel. We've already said that Peter proclaimed that Jesus Christ was Lord and Messiah. It is by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, but for whom God raised from the dead, that this man stands before you healed. Jesus is Lord and Messiah, and now you're seeing his healing done. But Jesus is the stone you builders rejected which has become the, the cornerstone. Salvation is found in no one else. See how the message is, is getting stronger to the religious leaders? For there is no other name under heaven given to mankind by which he must be saved. A choice has to be made. 
And, and we continually see here where Jesus is not giving up hope on the religious hypocrites because it is God's will that all men be saved. Verse 16, what are we going to do with these men, they asked. Everyone living in Jerusalem, okay, Jerusalem, and we'll watch how the gospel spreads, knows that they have performed a notable sign and we cannot deny it. But to stop this thing, this way of life, this freedom in Christ, but to stop this thing from spreading any further among the people, we must warn them to speak no longer to anyone in his name. Verse 20, Peter and John say, As for us, we cannot help speaking about what we have seen and heard. They're going to keep on. Jail doesn't mean that much. It's okay. What about when you come out of jail and you're like the man in the story and your wife sees him beheaded because of his faith? It didn't turn her faith. It increased her faith. Wow. So many times we say, why, Lord? Why, why am I going through this? Why, why, why do I have cancer? Why does my spouse have cancer or whatever? You know, those things happen because we live in a sinful world, period. The rain comes down, the sun shines on the good and the evil. But we have a choice to make in whether Jesus will be our King, our Lord, and whether we'll follow Him or we follow another. You're either with Jesus or you're against Jesus. And you're either gathering or you're scattering. So they pray as a response to the threat. We continually see prayer there. Verse 29, Now, Lord, consider their threats. Consider this sickness. Consider whatever it is. And, and you do what you need to do. But here's what they say. They don't say take the threat away or anything else. Consider their threats and enable your servants to speak your word with great boldness. Do you think they thought beatings were coming next? Stretch out your hand to heal and perform signs and wonders through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. We have another filling of the Holy Spirit. Verse 31, after they played, the place where they were meeting was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and what they testified. They spoke the word of God boldly. Each time we see the filling of the Holy Spirit, we see them proclaiming Jesus Christ. But we see the cost for proclaiming Jesus Christ is going up, up, up. Verse 32, this is the church that Jesus builds. It's like Acts chapter 2 again at the end of that chapter. But it's even stronger. All the believers were one heart and one mind. They had come together in complete unity. No one claimed that their possessions were their own, but they shared everything they had. With great power, the apostles continued to testify to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and God's grace was so powerfully at work among them all that there were no needy persons among them. For from time to time, those who owned lands or houses sold them, brought the money from the sales, and put them at the apostles' feet. And it was distributed to anyone who had need. We have this good example of an individual who lives a life that the church is living. Verse 36, Joseph, a Levite from Cyprus, for whom the apostles called Barnabas, which means son of encouragement, sold a field that he owned and brought the money and put it at the apostles' feet. Directly continuing on in chapter 5, now a man called Ananias, the opposite of that example together with his wife Sapphira, also sold a piece of property. With his wife's full knowledge, he kept back part of the money for himself, but brought the rest and put it at the apostles' feet. Then Peter said, Ananias, how is it that Satan has filled your heart that you have lied to the Holy Spirit? All this continual growth of the church, not only in numbers, but in maturity to be like Christ in this world. Now we've got a problem. We've got hypocrisy in this church where all of them were of one mind. All of them sold property. There were no needy people among them. The, the apostles were performing many mighty, mighty miracles. And despite jail, the people proclaimed the word of God with boldness. God stamps out the hypocrisy. Gone. And fear seizes the church and everyone that has heard these things. Verse 11, great 
Fear seized the whole church and all who heard about these events. Verse 12, the apostles performed many signs and wonders among the people, and all the believers met together in Solomon's colonnade. Verse 13, though, no one else dared join them, even though they were highly regarded by the people. The people who had not made a choice to accept Jesus as Lord and Savior, as the Messiah, they sat back and said, you know, this is great. These guys are highly admired. We love, but not the Sadducees and the religious leaders still. Remember, they're back here stewing. They said, this is great, but I don't want to sign up for this. I don't want to give up my possessions. I don't want to give up my right. I don't want to give up my throne that I think I sit on. I'm in control. And I certainly don't want to go to jail. But I see that everything that I see... This is amazing. I see the truth here. I'm just not willing to sign up for this. Verse 14. Nevertheless, more and more men and women believed in the Lord and were added to their number. We don't even have a count here now. The church that Jesus builds. Even though people are scared to death about joining the church that Jesus builds, the church still grows. And there are no fakers, no, no hypocrites. God took care of that problem. Verse 15, As a result, people brought the sick into the streets, laid them on the beds and mats so that at least Peter's shadow might fall on some of them as he passed by. Crowds gathered also from the towns, get this, around Jerusalem. Before, remember the, the Sadducees said, we've got to stamp this out because everybody in Jerusalem is believing. Now look, people from around Jerusalem are bringing their sick and those tormented by impure spirits and all of them are healed. But that's not exactly how the commission worked, is it? It wasn't that the people were going to bring them to Jerusalem. Is you're going to take the message out. And suffering is what, as we read on in Acts, drove the people from their homes in Jerusalem and spread them out. God is sovereign. He knows everything. He works all things together for those who love the Lord. Do you know that? Do you know that in the midst of whatever the suffering is that you're going through? There's still a choice that has to be made even if it costs you more and more and more to follow Jesus. Acts 5 verse 17, Then the high priests and all of his associates who were members of the party of the Sadducees were filled with jealousy. They arrested the apostles and put them in public jail. But during the night, an angel of the Lord opened the doors of the jail and brought them out. Go stand in the temple courts and tell the people all about this new life. At daybreak, they entered the temple courts as they had been told and began to teach the people. Now, that's as far as I'm going to get with Acts today, just so you know. So that's what? Five verses. But you had to set up the stage here. We've already been arrested. You've seen how the church has grown. Now, not two of the apostles get arrested with, with a witness because the man, the way you read Scripture, was there before because it says that the religious leaders couldn't deny because the man was there. Not that they saw the man, but he was there with them. So he must have got arrested too. But now you've got the 12 being arrested. This persecution that we're facing is seeming to grow and it will grow to the whole church. They were filled with jealousy. Why? Why would I be jealous that people are being healed? That, that people are living in such a way that, that they don't care about things that they have. They're giving to people so there's no needy people in the world anymore in my, in my community. Why, why would I be jealous about that? except my heart is focused on me, myself, and I. The things that I have, the pride that I have, the, the wealth that I have, all these other things, and I call myself a godly man. They were filled with jealousy because the praise that they should have been getting, the apostles were getting. But the apostles weren't getting the praise because they were directing it right back to Jesus. So there wasn't, the apostles were nothing but a conduit to Jesus. So they arrested the apostles. Why? Because they can't arrest Jesus because he rose from the dead. <laughs> He's gone. But maybe we can get his followers 
to not follow him anymore by turning up the heat a little bit more. So they put him in public jail. Verse 19, though. Now we see the second appearance of an angel or angelic messenger. First time we saw it in Acts chapter 1 was, why are you standing here? You've got something to do. You've got to go back and wait for the gift of the Holy Spirit so you can proclaim and do what Jesus proclaimed and did. Are you ready for this mission? Go sit and wait. <laughs> but during the night, an angel of the Lord opened the doors of the jail and brought them out. As you read on, you'll know, they didn't know what happened. There's nothing disturbed or touched. It has to be something far greater than we see or know, something spiritual that released these apostles from jail. So they're released by this messenger, this angelic messenger, and he says to them, go stand in the temple courts and tell the people all about this new life. Now that, this verse is just, you could spend forever on it. Go stand, don't sit, don't tarry, Go stand. Stand firm together, united. Doesn't matter that you were arrested. Go, go right back to the place where they arrested you, the place where they're going to come because it's at the temple and they're going to be really mad this time and jealous if they were before that you escaped or they're going to convert one or the other. Go back there and proclaim all the words of life. Don't leave anything out. Don't fear one thing. Proclaim all about this. Guess what, guys? What you signed up for? You know you signed up for getting rid of everything in this world. And you signed up for uh, maybe going to jail. But guess what, guys? There's probably more coming. Because you've got to know that they didn't say, okay, we're just going to go back there and everything's going to be fine. The religious leaders that crucified Jesus, you're ticking them off. What are they going to do next? And there's no, no implication here that the disciples tarried or did anything. It says, at daybreak they entered the temple courts as early as they could get back and do it, verse 21. As they had been told, and they began to teach the people. Would you do that? Would your faith be that strong? I bet you they stayed up most of the night praying too. I bet when they went, they were filled with the Holy Spirit and excited about preaching. I bet their preaching was the best it had ever been. And they were just put in jail. What do you think the people were thinking about? i tell you what I think they were thinking about. I'd rather fear God than the people. Because they've already seen all this. This is building this up to a people who would did not deny Jesus Christ but live for Him, period. Why? Because God's only Son gave up His life in heaven, His life on earth, and died for them so that they might live. Not just live, but have abundant life because all that came before them were thieves and robbers. And now I've called a new people, a royal priesthood together. I've given them the power. I dwell with them. They have intimacy and fellowship with God. Koinonia where they can cry out by the Spirit, Abba, Father, Daddy, help me do this mission that you have given me to do. Don't let anything distract me from it. <clears throat> the New Living Translation says, go to the temple and give the people this message of life. The <clears throat> English Standard Version says the words of this life. The Berrien Study Bible says the full message of this new life. The Berrien Literal Bible says all the words of this life. The King James Version says the words of this life. This life. This one. The one that I've got X amount of breaths to live. And I know the truth. I know who Jesus is. I know the mission that I have. I know the love that God has for me. So how can I not love Him? How can I not love even my enemy? Earl, you struggle with that when we talk about that. The Sadducees were their enemy. But you don't see anything here except they continue just to preach the message to the Sadducees with boldness. Knowing that they're the same ones that crucified Jesus. 
Go back, like I said, however many days pre previous that it's been, and the night that Jesus was crucified, and they were scattered. And Peter denied Jesus emphatically. It got worse each time. But now they're like, yes, we're going right back and we're going to preach. And whatever's going to happen to us is going to happen to us because we don't fear men. We have reverent fear for God and we have love for Him because of what Jesus Christ has done. Yeah, I'll deny myself. Yeah, I'll take up my cross. I will follow Jesus. Rescue to go back. Stand in the same spot where a bear came to you and then you poked it and went back there. Do you get it that way? That bear's going to come back mad. What do you think would happen next? But the church fears God and stands firm. Saved to suffer. That's what I asked you at first. What does that mean to you? To tell the people all about the, wor the words of this life. The life that you have in Jesus Christ. What would be the words that you would proclaim? If that's why you're saved, it's saved to proclaim. Who do you fear? Who do you live for? What about suffering? Stop and think about these things. I gave you the spoiler alert. What happens next? They're arrested again. And they're stripped of their skin for preaching about Jesus. I'll give you a little more spoiler alert, and we'll do the, cover this next week. When they got out of jail this time, woo we suffered for Jesus. I don't even know how they had the physical ability to go woo-hoo. I can't even get out of bed good in the mornings. They were tied down and stripped of their skin beat, and they considered it joy, and the church did also. I don't know about you. I don't, I don't want to pray to God to suffer, and, and I know He's put me where I'm at, and I know that it doesn't make me a better Christian or not Christian to say, oh, let me go suffer here or there. But to know what this church experienced, I'd like to experience that. To be a part of that. To have the words of life live so powerfully that anything I owned I didn't consider my own that when I signed up for this, that, that this is all that mattered to me because I had the words of life to share with everyone that I came in contact with. And no matter what it cost me, I counted as joy to suffer with Jesus because He's the one that suffered for me. I just wonder if that's what I would say or not. Makes me think. Father in heaven, we thank you for the freedoms that we do have. We know that people are persecuted for their faith all over this world, and that persecution still stands. And it's not just a, you're a Christian, I don't have anything to do with you. It's I want to kill you. We see that from the religious leaders here, the jealousy that they had when they should have had fear for you, O oh God. Lord, as Paul says, help us to throw away anything that hinders and the sins that so easily entangle us. Help us to run this race with perseverance. Help us to love even our enemies as Jesus loved us so that we can be a light to this world. Thank you for this church. Thank you for the Holy Spirit that binds us together, that seals us. Thank you for the fellowship that we do have. Not with just one another, but the fellowship with you. The peace that we have, no matter what's going on in our lives, we know that you work all things together for good for those that love you. Lord, help us to not be timid and afraid. And Lord, we just thank you for the freedom that we do have. And Lord, if we are ever faced with suffering, help us to bind our, us, our cords together to be stronger, to live by faith. May your Holy Spirit fill us and use us, Lord. May we not be believers but be proclaimers may we live a life that brings glory and honor to you and may we make a difference in our jerusalem and may that spread out to other parts of the world <coughs> father we do thank you and praise you in the name of jesus amen